This is the American Farmland Owner Podcast, real conversations for farm owners, operators, investors, and the people who care about the future of agriculture. I'm Dave Price. This week's guest is Matthew Dillon, or Matt Dillon. He doesn't really seem to care. He is the co-CEO of the Organic Trade Association, and he might surprise you with his sales pitch for producers to try organic. We'll get to that pitch in a few minutes. But first, co-CEO. What's with the title? All right, Mr. Co-CEO. What's that title mean? Well, it's a little bit unusual, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I share my CEO responsibilities with Tom Chapman. We both have a uh, deep background in agriculture and food systems, uh, complementary skills, and the board of directors of the Organic Trade Association in January decided that we would be more successful if we had a model in which we had two executives helping develop staff, um, serve our membership, and, and better address the regulatory uh, policy and marketing needs of the organization. So we divvied up. Tom is a whiz at foreign marketing. Uh, I work on ag policy and communications. Tom does data services. It's, it's been an interesting uh, approach. And Tom and I worked together at Cliff Barn Company for 10 years. So we learned how to, to discuss, debate, disagree, and still get stuff done. So it's going great so far. What's your favorite flavor? Cliff Bar? Yeah. I'm kind, of, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of a classic guy. Chocolate chip, peanut butter. Had it within arm's range. That was even worked out ahead of time. No, it, I always have product that contains blood sugar drugs. You can be an influencer. That's, a, that's what all the kids are trying to be these days. You probably have to cut that one. <laughs> I love it. All right, so you grew up in Nebraska, and I'm curious – it, it feels like in the in this industry, in this space, there's always something that either you met a person, you experienced it, something attracts you. So what? how did you get to this new gig? You just started in January, but yeah. how did you get there? Why, why is it? What's the connection for you? Well, I've worked in agriculture and food systems basically my whole life, but uh, I grew up in a conventional farm family, corn, soy, beans, cattle, alfalfa. Uh, relatively small, also sold inputs and ag supplies. Uh, and I didn't, and growing up in the 70s, you didn't hear of the word organic. Uh, but I went to a Benedictine monastery boarding school in Elkhorn, Nebraska for high school, and the monks grew produce, organic produce, for a natural food store. Um, we also had, my family, in addition to corn, soy, all that, we had a five acre garden that we grew produce. My sisters and I sold. Uh, tomatoes and sweet corn door to door in Omaha um, as kids. My dad would drive us around and we'd try to sell it. And I didn't think that much of organic produce at the time. I just thought, man, eh, this doesn't look as good as my produce. And I'll be honest, I think at the time organic didn't have all of their, their pest management dialed in. But over the years, I became intrigued about, I saw a rural economy in Nebraska that was suffering. And we lost 16,000 farms to bankruptcy in a two-year period in the late 70s. Uh, major farm crisis. And I started to see organic as an opportunity both for environmental management, pesticide and synthetic fertilizer mitigation, but also economic opportunity for farmers and rural communities to capture a little bit more value from consumers who are interested in food produced in a certain way and animals treated a certain way and the soil managed in a certain way. And so for me, it's always been that combination of economic resilience for farms and communities, um, health of farm farmers and farm workers. And when I choose organic, I choose it thinking about the health of farmers and farm workers and an, a choice, an option that farmers can opt into regulations and opt into markets to diversify their farms. And that's been my motivation for 25, 30 years. All right, so when you, peop when you talk to people who hear the word organic, Yep. Maybe they're a consumer to be like, okay, that's going to be more expensive. Or if you're a grower, uh, farmland operator, and you're like, all right, it's going to it's going to increase my costs. How do you, how do you respond to those? Uh, well, the data on consumers is a really interesting study that just 
came out a couple of weeks back that showed that if you take meat and, and dairy animal products out of the equation, cost of organic is only about 10 to 12 percent higher than conventional. You add meat and dairy and it, it pops up into more, I believe, like 25 percent. I can send it to you. Um, so there is additional cost. I think this is, again, consumer choice. Some consumers value their food. They think of food as medicine. They think of food as how they vote with their dollars, express their values. And for some consumers, they make that choice. Um, we have data that shows that it is not just the top earners in the country that are buying organic households. Cross de demographic ranges are buying organic. They might prioritize buying for their children baby food or fresh produce or, or dairy products before they you know, buy some other products. Um, but there is an, an opportunity for access and we wanna to continue to improve that opportunity for access and make sure those consumers understand the value proposition of what they're getting. For farmers, it's a little more complicated because for farmers, there's a three-year transition from conventional to organic. And in that transition, there's a lot of learning. There's sometimes new tools and equipment that are needed. Um, there's in that three year, you're selling your product still as conventional, but you're practicing organic and sometimes yields will go down. Um, and so there's a cost, we call it the, you know, the valley of transition. It's not easy. And what I encourage farmers is to find business partners who can help support them, find the right technical assistance providers and, and do the economic modeling to make sure you understand what it looks like in year four, five, and six to get you back towards not just Whole, but even greater profitability. And, and the modeling we see, that's what happens. Um, farmers lose a little bit of money in the first three years of transition, but it more than pays up for it in year four, five, and six. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a lot to ask of a farmer. And one of the things that Organic Trade Association we're always doing is looking for resources to help with that transition, to provide technical assistance. We started a program called the Organic Agronomy training series, OATS, to help train agronomists, to help farmers with that transition, agronomists that work for private sector landowners, as well as for in the public sector. Uh, if you don't bring the farmers along, it's going to be a rough road because it is learning some new things. And as you're looking at all of this data, is it, does, this, does the, the consumer skew younger on this? Are you seeing that? Again, across demographics, we see uh, it, strong interest and strong trust in organic from our consumer surveys. 55% of my generation, Gen X, and the older generation boomers um, believe that organic meets their values and, and has a, a value proposition, is worth the, the expenditure. If you go down to millennials and Gen Z, it jumps to 77%. So the trend we've been seeing is that generations moving into their strength as consumers are more and more interested in transparency, understanding how their food is produced and having an assurance of that, sustainability, animal welfare, uh, and they're demanding more from their brands to, to show them that in making their food, they're thinking about the future of the planet and they're thinking about their well-being. And produce, according to, to your research, that's the biggest chunk so far, right? As yeah. you look at this, so yeah. what's the extended business model? Do you see that continuing to expand and then that maybe attracts folks to look in other areas or how do you look at that? Yeah, pro, you know, what we used to call the, you know, the outside of the supermarket was the initial entry for most folks in organic. So it was produce, dairy, eggs. That was, those were the main entry points for organic for most households and where we saw the strongest growth in the first you know, 10 to 15 years of the industry by far to the point that over 15% of the produce sold in the U.S. is, is organic. Uh, uh, dairy and eggs, over 8% of the produce of dairy and eggs sold in the, in the U.S. Is, is organic. So it's, 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 those are still solid segments. There's been some slowing in produce. I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, and we're starting to see growth now in what, the inside of the supermarket. So in snacks, in beverages, in uh, baby food, one of the fastest growing categories by far, uh, fiber, um, feminine hygiene products, in, in the fiber contained within. Um, those are all opportunities that 
we're excited about for our producers and our businesses, but absolutely produce dairy eggs are going to remain strong. We New growth in meat, you know, meat is tough, like actual beef, lamb, chicken, it's been tough to really, for us to, to enter into because they are more expensive, as I said earlier, um, but we're starting to see it particularly in poultry and with some large traditional poultry producers moving in and starting their own organic brands as well as fast emerging young brands developing. And I think poultry is one of the most exciting segments for us in terms of, of meat products. We've been through so much since COVID hit yeah, yeah. and, you know, a decimated restaurant, obviously right away, then everybody's yeah. eating at home. And then now, you know, we're trying to figure our way out. It seems like uh, uh, consumers yeah. are more to go uh, yeah. than, than perhaps I've got a brother in the restaurant industry and it's just different, right? Like they've, yeah. they've really Absolutely. had to think hard about the to-go side of it, especially younger folks who yeah. want to kind of get it or get it delivered to them. Yeah, our data shows the challenge of COVID. So, you know, in 2020, um, meat, poultry, and seafood grew at 24.7% for organic. Massive increase. Um, frozen food, 15%. Beverages, 13%. Produce, almost 11%. Dairy and eggs, 12%. So massive growth during 2020, and then a decline in 2021. Not In some categories, not actually a decline, but a slowing of growth. So produce dropped from 10.9 to 5.8. And it's continued to kind of slow in its growth after that big bur burst. That's normal. Like that's, a, that's a, a normal correction for an abnormal event. So we're really not too worried about that slowing of growth. I think the question becomes, what's the, the new norm become now that we're a few years out? Because as you say, consumers are eating more at, to go at going out to restaurants, food services. Our industry survey does not capture those retail dollars. We, we capture retail dollars at grocery. We don't capture food service dollars, restaurant dollars. Um, it's something we're trying to figure out how to expand into. And overall, I would say most of the organic farmers and brands that I know are trying to figure out how to get into those larger food service distributors and suppliers because we see in schools, universities, corporate campuses, that is where we all eat. And it's, it is this cutting edge of opportunity. So how do you see the industry dealing with this inflationary squeeze? Yeah. I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago, we talked about so much clearly for some folks, the, the additional cost of groceries is almost yeah. too much, right? Like their, their yeah. income is not gone enough to make up for it. But for some folks, it's kind of the sticker shock that's in your head, almost yeah. an emotional reaction Absolutely. rather than Even a physical you can afford reaction. It. Yeah. Even if you can afford yeah. it, it's still like, wait, what? Yeah. Uh, how much for that one avocado? Like it's, mm -hmm. we all have those psychological ceilings, no matter what our income. It's a challenge. I mean, I'm not going to uh, avoid it. Like, I think that's part of why things like produce, we've seen you know, this, this year, we were 2.6% growth in produce. You know, we've been in an industry that's been growing it often at double digits. And to part of that slowness is uh, the writing of where consumers, you know, we grew real so fast over COVID, but part of it is inflation and sticker shock. And then produce, for example, there, the inflationary pressures include things like labor, where there's a real challenge with farm workers. It includes challenges with water, uh, especially like in California, Arizona. Uh, and so there's a number of pressures on our farmers, on our produce farmers, that extend into pricing for consumers. I, I think we have to solve for these things systemically and help make sure that we have adequate labor, we have adequate resources, water resources for our farmers, and hopefully inflationary pressures start to diminish. I think we're starting to see some of that. We just finished Organic Week, our biggest week of the year, where we have 270 members gathered to talk. And then the council sessions on produce, on dairy, on you know fiber, all of the categories, there was much more of a bullish feel in what the first quarter of this year looked like compared to the last couple of years. I want to ask you about the farm bill, but and I should have asked you this earlier, but some of the words, the word organic yeah. to you with OTA, what does yeah. that word mean? Well, organic has very strict definitions defined by law. So, you know, there are words like sustainable out there in the marketplace, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, or natural in the marketplace that have zero definition 
There's no legal definition. The courts often fight over it when consumers sue for accusations of greenwashing around sustainability or natural. Uh, organic is the only label in the marketplace that is regulated by federal law. And it has often not only civil penalties, but criminal pe penalties for fraud. So the definition of organic as the U.S. Department of Agriculture sees it, the same definition we go by. And it's, it's one in which it, it's more than just like a claim or terms. It's a whole cascade of standards and practices that farmers and businesses have to follow in order to be able to make that USDA organic claim. That's both our strength of how, how enforced and how, um, how, how much degree of, of oversight there is in making sure people are meeting those standards. But it's also one of our challenges and it's complex. It's like, what does organic mean for dairy products is not necessarily this exact same answer as what does it mean for fiber products or for produce? What, is it, what does that mean you're actually getting from your food? Generally, people think about it in terms of the absence of, so the absence mm -hmm. of some synthetic fertilizers, the absence of genetically modified seeds or other components, um, the absence of uh, artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, um, sewage sludge, like all of those absence. And, and that is, those are all true. Um, but I, I think more and more at Organic Trade Association, we want consumers to recognize the benefits of organic. That as an organic farmer, you have to have a biodiversity strategy at your farm. You have to have a soil management strategy. Um, those are the those are the plus components, not just the absence of components. Okay, and let's get into that farm bill. Yeah. Uh, it's all it's already long overdue, obviously, and now we're in an election year, and the clock is ticking on this. You're you're already as an organization a little bummed out by what you've seen early on, right? For a, yeah. in, in theory, a farm bill, if they would do it, would be a five-year commitment, gives a little certainty on a lot of issues, right? What, what's missing? Yeah, I mean, I think policy and regulatory certainty are necessary for all businesses in the ag and food space, whether you're a farmer or an man aggregator, manufacturer, retailer, it, it, we all rely on consistency and predictability. And the challenges we continue to have in public policy uh, with, with I'll call it what I think it is, bipartisan bickering that ignores the needs of constituents um, for the grandstanding of, of politics it is a real problem. Um, we wanted a farm bill last year. I think everybody in ag and food did. We wanted that consistency. Uh, I'm not optimistic that we get there before the election. Maybe we, we see a lame duck farm bill with an extension before that. Um, I will say that we certainly are grateful that in the frame the frameworks, both for the House and the Senate, there are some of the priorities that we want in organic to continue to grow our sector and for enforceability, integrity, fraud prevention, investment in domestic organic market opportunities. There's in, in each of the frameworks, there's parts of that. It's certainly not everything we, we want to see, um, but more importantly, we, we want the farm bill to get done um, and, and to really get into a, a future atmosphere in DC where we can work a little bit more efficiently together as we haven't passed farm bills. Um, it, it doesn't need to be this way. But that's, this is not going to happen before November. No, it's not happening before November. No, we're, we're in, we're deep in that situation where, um, the parties have kind of drawn up the drawbridges and the moats and they're occasionally saying something positive about progress, but it's hard to see a pathway before November. And so I think post-election, a lame duck bill is our, our best bet at this point. So would you go forward with your priorities, go for just an extension and then hope to, to work some of these things back in? I mean, I think, don't think the Organic Trade Association or any entity, the Farm Bureau, the larger entities than us, I don't think anyone has the power uh, to do much more than vote for an extension in which their priorities have some, at least, con continuation of current funding. Like that's in an extension, we'd be looking for continuation of current funding levels for the National Organic Program, for organic research, for technical assistance for our farmers. Um in a new farm bill, of course, we want to see the expansion of, but um, 
ideally we all want a new farm bill. Um, we want that iterative evolution of policy that serves producers, rural communities, and consumer demands. I just don't think it happens this, this, you know, in, in this cycle. Okay, so that's a huge unknown. Let's push somehow push that to yeah. the side. Yeah. Where's the future? Where do you see the future growth of this industry? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very optimistic about how younger generations really do really care about transparency uh, in their food and want more information and understanding of how their food is produced. But really want both the government and brands to address some of the problems that have been created, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's soil health, whether it's equity and like family farmers actually like medium sized family farmers actually surviving and passing their farms down to the next generation. I'm very optimistic that this next generation sincerely wants that in their food and they're willing to pay for it. And they're also willing to advocate for it. So that gives me a lot of optimism. Um, I think the other opportunity we have is that organic first came out being all about like what we were not like, again, not the absence of GMOs, the absence of things. We're not those guys. I think there's an opportunity for organic brands, the trade association as a whole to start to talk about organic in a way that's more about the benefits of for farmers, for farm workers, for consumers and, and, and attract um, new consumers to the opportunity for organic in a new way um, with, with different kinds of products. And I see that starting to happen. I think it's great when large company, like larger scale food companies also start to put their toe in the water with organic and larger scale farmers do. Like I'm, I'm optimistic that there's so many split operations. And what a split operation is, Dave, is an operation that they might be predominantly conventional, but they want to play in the organic market as a, a, a tool for diversifying their farm economy, for, for you know playing markets. And hey, if the conventional market's down in corn and soy, maybe the organic market's a little bit better. Uh, and so we see a lot of farmers that are might be 60, 70% conventional, but they're slowly transitioning small amounts of organic. I wanna expand those opportunities and let those farmers opt into our regulations, opt into our marketplace and try to capture that economic resilience for their family farms. I'm very optimistic about that trend. Uh, hearing you say that, that's exactly what I was thinking hearing you talking. And when you were talking about, you know, if you're really trying to flip the switch, it's you're looking at a three-year transition like you laid yeah. out before. So yeah. from the most practical standpoint for folks, is it more likely that I think your analogy was toe in the water where you yeah. just, maybe it's only a small sliver Yep. And then the thinking is maybe that sliver grows. I know farmers that have 3,000 acres that started at 200 acres organic just mm -hmm. to figure out pest management, fertility mm -hmm. management. Like what were, what is, what is an organic system plan look like as a farm? How, what, do I, what, rec, what records do I need to keep? They wanted to figure that out and, and get, get that stability under them before they started increasing. And those farm, this farm I'm thinking of is, gone all the way to 3,000 acres, all the way organic. Uh, and so that's not just a, it's a single anomaly. Like I know many farmers that that's happened at different scales. Um, I think that's smart. I respect that. It's like, learn the system, learn the challenges, learn the culture, learn the agriculture, and then see if the opportunity is there for you more whole hog. If not, there's plenty of folks who keep split operations, especially in dairy where you might want to bring for different reasons your your calves over from organic into conventional if you're having some health issues that are more challenging to treat organically you, you want to have a conventional herd as well go whole Lots hog but go organic hog yes for sure <laughs> you definitely need more organic pork both in the farm bill and on my plate all right hey thank you much for the time and the conversation yeah, yeah. happy to do it i uh, really appreciate uh, the questions Dave. he's matthew dillon and matt dillon co-ceo of the organic trade association you can learn more about the ota from afo just check out the american farmland owner weekly email newsletter where we collect some of the top stories impacting farmland you can find it at AmericanFarmlandOwner.com, the place where landowners get their news. 
Just put your email in there and we will send you the newsletter as soon as it's ready every week. And we'd appreciate it if you'd help spread the word, help us grow. Thanks for caring about the future of our farmland. We'll talk to you next time.